Hi everyone, I'm Cody Rue, and this is the Church of Logic. Today, we're going to talk about the P versus NP problem again. I'm going to try and give a little more context. Last time, we talked about non-deterministic polynomial time machines. I explained that they're machines that have this input that they're trying to solve a problem on. I gave the examples of finding a satisfying assignment for Boolean formulas. There are many, many other problems. One of them is, uh, for example, finding factors of a non-prime number or finding cycles in a graph. These are problems that are easy to solve if you already have a solution. That seems tautological, but it's basically, it's easy to check that a solution is actually a true solution to these problems. What seems harder is whether it's possible to solve these problems in polynomial time without having a solution. The central P versus NP question is prove whether that's the case or not. Prove whether it is impossible to solve certain easy to verify problems without having the solution already in hand, or whether there's some crazy polynomial time algorithm that can solve these really hard, these seemingly hard problems, but that are easy to verify. So one cool thing, and it's a little bit mysterious, I'm not sure I'm going to explain the proof of this, is that it turns out that this Boolean satisfiability problem is universal among all these easy to check problems. What does that mean? It means that uh, the technical term here is NP complete. Uh, what does NP complete mean? Uh, it means that any problem of this sort where a Turing machine is, is checking a solution that it has and it's checking it quickly, that can be turned into a satisfiability problem. And that actually can be done quickly. You can sort of quickly turn the, the problem you're concerned about, you know, some problem on graphs, like finding a Hamiltonian cycle, which is to say a cycle that goes through every node once and only once. You can turn that into a, um, sorry, at every edge once or only once, you can turn that into a satisfiability problem. And it's kind of mystifying that you would be able to do this for any possible seen or unseen, you know, Turing, Turing machine, non-deterministic Turing machine, right? It's very, it's very much not obvious. But this comes from the fact that we have this kind of bounded Turing completeness for Boolean circuits, right? I, I mentioned that Turing completeness is every programming language you have, you can sort of turn it into a Turing machine or turn it into a Lambda function. There's a sort of like universal translation. Well, it turns out that there's a similar thing that happens for polynomial non-deterministic checkers, which is if you have a Turing machine that takes an input and that checks it, you can turn that by looking at each action and turning it into this kind of giant flow graph, you can turn it into a Boolean satisfiability problem. And then you can say, okay, well, if I can solve the satisfiability problem, then I can show that the, the, that the um, Turing machine would have returned yes on this problem. All right, and, and similarly, if I could guess an input that would return true on the Boolean problem, then I could guess an input where the Turing machine would, would answer yes. So really they are the same problem. And the, and the fact that we've defined this class to be the set of all you know problems that can be solved with Turing machines with, with guesses, that means if we can solve the SAT problem, then we can use this transformation, which again is very concrete, uh, and take any other problem that we know how to quickly verify into a SAT problem and then presumably run this hypothetical algorithm. So when I was younger, I saw this problem. And, and again, it's a problem that that's, um, you know, has a bounty of a million dollars. And I was like, hey, this seems very simple. Why don't I think about it for a little bit? And for all you viewers out there, I don't want to discover, uh, I don't want to discourage you 
from working on hard problems. I, I think it's a good motivator. But I also don't want you to think that you've solved a hard problem when you haven't. That is something that can really harm a mathematician, especially if they're not well known, uh, because it's 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 very. Um, it really hurts your credibility to claim you've solved something. There are people who claim they've solved something, you know, every couple of months. And at some point, people just stop listening to them. So, okay, so let this be a caveat for you. If there is a problem that is worth a million dollars, which again, in mathematics is a humongous amount of money, then any simple few line solution you think you have of that problem is certainly wrong with quasi certainty it is wrong. So one obvious thing that came to mind was why don't I just try the usual trick in computer science, which is apply the diagonal argument. In in the episodes back when I when I proved or gave the proof that um, the halting problem is undecidable, I had this standard technique. And, and this is a similar problem, right? We're trying to prove that there is no algorithm that can do a certain thing. For the halting problem, we said, okay, there's no algorithm that can tell whether another Turing machine halts. And here we're sort of saying, there is no algorithm that runs in polynomial time that can tell whether a non-deterministic Turing machine accepts, right? So we could try the same trick, which is assume that we have one and then try to use it against itself to get a contradiction. But this doesn't really work. There's a similar argument which does work, which shows that polynomial time Turing machines certainly can't solve all the problems solved by exponential time Turing machines, right? And here you really can use this trick. You assume that it can, you use it to simulate itself, and you flip the output. And this shows that such a machine can exist because if it exists, it would, on this hypothetical you know, input, it would return both true and false. So the same trick, you, you kind of want to apply it here, but it doesn't apply because um, a non-deterministic Turing machine, you know, if you had a deterministic Turing machine and uh, you could use it to, to solve any of these non-deterministic problems, you could use it against itself, but that doesn't seem to help you much, right? And flipping the answer isn't really a, a reasonable thing to do with these non-deterministic Turing machines, right? Because they they have this sort of, there exists a guess such that, you know, the Turing machine uh, answer is true. But but if you flip an exists, you, get, you don't get an exists. So uh, this is kind of a wishy-washy statement, but it should say intuitively that diagonalization doesn't obviously work. And people have thought about this quite a bit because of course, diagonalization is an important technique. And they've concluded that not only does diagonalization not obviously work, but it almost surely doesn't work at all. And this is a really fascinating situation, which I don't think any other math conjecture has really had to this extent, which is people have thought about whole classes of possible solutions and come up with reasons why these whole big classes can't work. In the case of diagonalization, it's this really fascinating result that any diagonalization argument that would work would actually work too much. Um, and I'll explain what too much means some other time, I think. But uh, the vague idea is that if you have a Turing machine that has an oracle, right, it, it can ask for answers from some magical genie. Uh, this diagonalization argument still works. But this problem, this P versus NP problem, doesn't, doesn't work against oracles roughly. Um, it, it, there are some oracles where P is equal to NP and some other oracles where P is not equal to NP. So we have these magical worlds where, where these two classes of complexity are actually different. And, and so any diagonalization argument that would make them different everywhere can't possibly work. There are other really, really fascinating obstructions to given proofs. Mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, and logicians have thought about this problem for you know literally 50 years. 
very, very hard. And they've come up with all these fascinating strategies. And they've come up with reasons why their strategies might not work. I think this is really exciting. There's actually no current proof that uh, anything that solves uh, a satisfiability problem, right? That, that says whether something is satisfiable or unsatisfiable. Uh, we know that it has to at least be linear time, right? Because that, that's the, just reading the input takes linear time. But we don't even know whether it, it takes more than linear time, right? This is not known. This is crazy. We would expect at least a proof that, oh yeah, it needs to be at least squared. But, but we just don't know that. We don't even know if it takes more than logarithmic amount of space, right? That, that means that it doesn't even need to store anything in its long-term memory, right? It can just look at the input, store a very small amount of, of data and, and answer the problem. We, don't, we can't exclude that case. But um, there are some interesting partial results. And, and the attempts we've made over the years to attack this problem, I find to be really fascinating. I think I'll talk more about this in the upcoming episodes because there's so much to unpack here about how we think about machines and how we think about, you know, the feasibility, the, the, the practicalities of computation. And again, this is not really a logic problem, but I think it has strong connections to logic. And I'll talk about those as well. Until then, take care.